Today is the sixth Sunday of Easter. Let's begin with the life and work of the pastoral charge. It's on the back of your bulletins. First, we have our lectionary readings for the day. And I want you to know that Bible study via Zoom, and this is the last Bible study that's currently um, still working, uh, still uh, in progress. It's uh, the one via Zoom. We're going to meet on Monday, May the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. St. James Board of Management is going to meet in person at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, May the 25th here at the church. And St. James Fish Chowder Supper, which is a drive through supper, served with roll and dessert, will be held from 4 to 6 p.m. on Saturday, May the 28th. It's cash only for $15, and as I say, drive through only. Uh, we got notice from AST that they wanted us to let you know that a one-day conference, or maybe, maybe a better word would be workshop, is going to take place on June the 4th. It's called Aging Gracefully in a Strange New World, Psychological and Spiritual Dimensions. It's organized by the AST faculty. It will take place in Halifax on June the 4th, and that's all I know about it. You have to go in on that, um, that particular website to find out more about it. Our annual meetings are coming up. Park Hills is going to be next week at 9, th um, following a short worship at 9.30. St. James annual meeting is going to be held on June the 12th, following a short worship and immediately followed by the Pastoral Charge Annual Meeting, which will take place at 12.30. The bulletin is dedicated to the glory of God in memory of Jean Henneberry, from Kenny and Debbie Garrison, Eva Mae Gray, Pam Halstead, and her mom Kay Halstead, and in memory of Annie Drew Purcell from Eva Mae Gray. Are there any other announcements? Yes. <clears throat> Just a reminder that people uh, haven't had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to go in and uh, Oh, well, the profile committee. The profile committee has some questions posted. And how can you access those? Is, is it on Facebook? Yeah, the link is right on the Facebook okay. page, Megan's uh, posting. Right. Yeah. So the link is on the Facebook page, the St. James um, Facebook page. The link is there. Click on the link and you'll be taken to the questions. Anything else? Any birthdays or anniversaries? Would someone be willing to light the Christ candle? Okay. Thank you. The light of the risen Christ shines for all to see. May, May that, that light shine in our hearts and in, in our lives. lives. Please stand as you're able for the introit. today. God knows. It could be the joy of singing or a passage of scripture. It could be the sound of a friends yeah. gathering for worship. Or even the silence between the sounds. As we worship, let's listen for the Spirit inviting us to see and hear and feel God's presence. Let us pray. Holy One, gather us in, mark us Shape us in your love, not our definition of love, O God, but yours. Not our feelings of love that come and go, but yours that lasts forever. Call us to worship today and put your mark of love upon our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
And our first hymn is in your hymn books, which we're not really used to using here in the sanctuary. And I think you're going to find they're going to, they're going to feel a little bit heavy. But uh, the hymn books are in your pews, so please turn to 396, Jesus Stand Among Us. Have you ever had a friend move away? Maybe it happened when you were young. You had some, a childhood friend, let's say. Or maybe it happened even as an adult. Someone you were friends with and they move away. And So have any of you had a friend who's moved away? You need to really go like this because I can't see your, your responses. I've been the mover away. Oh, you've been the one who's moved. So, how did it feel? How did it feel when you, someone you really cared about moved away or when you moved away? How was it? Sad. Sad. Yep, you feel sad and lonely. Maybe even scared. You know, if you're moving to a place, maybe a little nervous or worried. Does it feel like your friend is still with you? Does it ever feel like that? Hmm? I'm thinking of those times when someone in our household has moved away. And I'll hear a sound somewhere and I'll think it's them, but it isn't. They're not there. So then I feel sad again. <laughs> but this is what it's like when someone leaves, hey? What are some of the things you can do to remember your friend or that person who's left? What can you do to remember? If something they've given me, I try to have it somewhere that I can see it. So if they've given you something like a keepsake, put it in a place where you can readily see it. That'll remind you. A picture? A picture will do it, yeah. Could be a photo. It could be a photo of your friend or a photo of something that you share together. Some kind of, you know, some event that happened or a place where you were, maybe on the beach or in the woods or who knows. You know, where? <coughs> Pardon? You can write them a letter. Fewer people are doing that these days, but you can write them a letter, send them an email, call them on the phone, all kinds of things you can do. We've been hearing stories during this Easter season about how Jesus appeared to the disciples for 40 days after he uh, rose from the dead, and he taught them many things when he came back. There's also the story about when Jesus went to be with God forever and the disciples no longer experienced him on earth in the same way. We call this ascension and remember it on, on what has been named Ascension Day. It's going to happen this Thursday. It's exactly 40 days after Easter. But I think the important thing is to remember how the, the disciples felt when Jesus was gone. Jesus had been their closest friend, and then he was put to death, and they felt 
sad and lost and alone. And then came the good news about Easter, that it was alive and with them in a new way. But then came the time, you know, after 40 days, when he, he was, well, when he left to be with God. And, and after that, they weren't going to really see him anymore. And just like when a good friend moves away, and you wonder who you're going to play with or associate with and do special things with, the disciples wondered how they were going to get along without Jesus. But then they were reminded of something he said to them before he died. It was when they were having their last meal together, remember? And Jesus said that God's Spirit would be with them just as God's Spirit had been with him. And it was to help them remember everything that Jesus had taught them about God's way. And the disciples didn't have to worry about Jesus not being with them because God's Spirit would now be with them and, and, and in them as close as every breath, and it would be always, it would be everywhere, and this was to help them. Now we can't see God's Spirit, but we can feel the presence of God, can't we? And, and it's kind of like the special feeling we get when we remember a well-loved friend. Remember what that's like? We feel them with us, uh, talking with us, doing special things with us. And because of Jesus, we have a new understanding of God's spirit in the world, guiding us and helping us to spread God's love to everyone. So now we're gonna sing, and I'm gonna ask you to get out more voices. Turn to page 156, the soft cover book. And again, it's, so, it's been so long since we opened our books, isn't it?
I have told you this now before it all happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. May God bless this reading of the Holy Word. If you read the Gospel of John all the way through, you'll find that things really start to slow down in chapter 14. What's happened? Well, the Last Supper is over. Judas has taken off. They just completely disappeared. Everybody's feet are clean, and, and Jesus' hands are probably all shriveled up. Uh, like a prune from all that washing. And then Jesus begins to talk to them. What does he say? You remember some of those words? Love one another. 
Do not be afraid. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but I will not leave you orphaned. What, what's another one? I go to prepare a place for you. So often we hear these during funerals, right? These words. And what else? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And Jesus goes on for, oh, it's about four chapters. He's telling his friends everything they need to know before he goes away. Where's he going? Well, he's going to die, actually. Only, you know, it's to hear him tell it, you wouldn't think that, because he sounds like he's headed off for a family reunion. But it's one with his beloved dad. And no one else is invited to it, just him. But he's going to leave his friends, his disciples, in charge while he's gone. He will be back. But what he does is leave them with a list that's so long that they start to get a bit anxious about how long he'll be away. So, how long, like, where are you going? How long are you going to be gone? Just a while, he says. And then you'll see me. And sure enough, later on, some of them did. Right? Right, when he was raised. Uh, but then he was gone again. And a little while became a long while. And a long while became whole lifetime and 10 years turned into 100 which turned into 500 which turned into a thousand and now from where we're sitting it's been so long that some of us wonder if we haven't been orphaned after all so we we ask ourselves is he gone or isn't he and if he's gone where is he gone to and what are we going to do without him? And if he's not gone, then, then where is he? And why doesn't he show himself? So, what's a good analogy for this? Did you ever babysit when you were younger? Did you ever look after some of your younger siblings or somebody else's siblings or children from another family? Anybody ever do that? Yeah. Well, as the eldest of four children, I was the designated babysitter in my family. From the time I was 12, I was the one my parents left in charge when they went out for the evening. Now, first my folks would sit me down and remind me of how much they trusted me. That was important to be told every time. Not only because I was the eldest, but because I was the most responsible one. And looking at my brothers, I would have to agree with them there. Yeah, probably. I mean, I wouldn't let the house burn down. I would not let strangers into the house. And I wouldn't let my brothers or my sister do anything dangerous or foolish. I would keep an eye on them. Then my mom would show me, you know, all the notes on the fridge that she had. The note that uh, gave the phone number of where she was. Visiting my, you know, usually it was my Aunt Helen Uncle Jim McKay up in Arndale. Not that far away, but if something happened, she had another note there with my Uncle Bruce's, Bruce Ubley's number, because he was just over on Dennis Road. So I had his number if I got, you know, into real trouble. And then we'd all walk them to the door, and we'd give hugs and kisses, and then they'd go. And we'd shut the door, I'd turn the lock, and a new atmosphere would pervade the house. <laughs> I was in charge. And I thought, when I turned around to face my brothers and my sister, I could see the looks on their faces. They were, they were half scared and half excited. <laughs> they didn't know whether to be afraid of what was going to happen or, ooh, what is going to happen now? What are we going to do? Well, we play games. Because, you know, I was a good babysitter. I had games up my, up my sleeve. and we, I loved to read stories, so read them stories. We'd have special snacks. But then, you know, as the night wore on, they'd start to get a little, I don't know, antsy, cranky, argumentative. Well, the arguments would start. They always do. And then, of course, the questions. Oh, where are they? When are they coming back? And I'd say it over and over. I'd give them the answer, and then I'd promise them if they just go to bed, then Mom and Dad would look in on them before 
before they went to sleep, or if they were asleep, mom and dad would go in just to check on them. And I tried to make everything seem normal. But you know, how did I know? I mean, our parents might have a terrible accident. They might never come home. And then what would happen to the four of us? A kid thinks of these things, you know. Who would want four noisy kids? And what if we got separated, you know, sent to different homes? Ugh. Well, it was hard being the babysitter because, you know, I was a potential orphan too. I had as much to lose as they did. But I wouldn't give into it because I was the one in charge. I was the one who was supposed to know better and overcome any fears or weaknesses I might have. Now, I'm sure plenty of you know what I mean. Partly because you were babysitters too, and partly because you are Christians. We are, all of us, Christ's elder children in the world. The ones he's, he's left to look after things. We're supposed to be the responsible ones, the ones he's entrusted to carry on in his name. And everywhere we go, we see the faces of those whom he's given into our care. And some of them just yearn to see him. And some of them could care less. Some of them are still open to him, to his experiencing his presence. And some of them are just closed right off. Some are still waiting. Some of them gave up a long time ago. I mean, at first, they would jump out of bed and they heard footsteps on the stairs, but, you know, after a while, you, you start to learn better than that. Morning may come or it may not, and they may try to find him or may not. And they just eventually find their way to somewhere else, to what they think is a more reliable light. So, where is he? And where did he go? And when will he be back? Because, remember, it's hard being the ones, well, in charge, because we're actually not in charge, are we? We're just getting along as, as best we can. And we're considering ourselves potential orphans, too. Except, he said, we would not be. Remember, that was a part of the lesson, the passage from Scripture that, that Doug read. He said he was going away, but he'd be back. And not only at the end of time, the very, very end, no. What did he say? Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Not visit, not just, you know, pass by, you know. We'll come to them and make our home with them. And John only uses this word home twice in his whole gospel. Both times, it's around the Last Supper, at the Last Supper table. In my Father's house, there are many homes or dwelling places. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. That's one time. It's not a temporary place. It's a permanent one. And it's a place that's large enough to accommodate the love that binds him to his Father on one hand and binds him to us on the other. I mean, it's a, it's a huge heart of a place with room enough for everybody. Because it's John's idea of heaven to move in with the God who's moved in with us. Only, if you'll notice, the address has changed between the first time he wrote it down and the second. It was out there somewhere the first time, a place in the future where only Jesus was going to. Remember, I'm going there with my father to see my father, and no one else could go. But the second time John writes it down, Jesus is no longer going, but coming. The place is not out there somewhere, but right here. A place in the present where God dwells with those who love Jesus and keep his word. And what does he call it? Abiding. Staying put. We will come to them and make our home with them. Uh, the details aren't all that clear, but abiding seems to involve being part of this large extended family. When God and Jesus move in with us, apparently, they make lots of room. Room for the Holy Spirit, room for other disciples, room for all kinds of relatives, you know, cousins and some such. 
coming and going well we learn to recognize each other we do we realize that we are related and we call upon each other for everything that people who are related to one another do and I gotta say, whatever else this is, it's mighty good news for us babysitters, right? Because it means we're not alone in the house. There's somebody else at home, in us and in those for whom we care, which is so great because it means we don't have to pretend, as I say, to be in charge because God's in charge. We don't have to pretend to be what would we call God-sized, we can be human-sized, with room in us for God to dwell and, and heal all our hearts from the inside out. It's, I think it's good news for orphans too, because we don't have to be. The ones who truly love us live on inside us. And we've, we've learned a new way of communicating with them since they are inside us, all these loved ones we had that have passed on. And when we want to talk with them, we can do it in our minds and in our hearts. We have to sit down and listen really carefully because more often than not, it happens in the silence. Right? But there can be no doubt about where home is for them or for us. Coming or going, God dwells with us and, and leaves notes all over the place. You know, I was talking about those notes on the refrigerator. Well, Jesus left all kinds of notes for us too. Uh, notes like, love one another. Don't be afraid. Believe in God, believe also in me. If it were not so, would I have told you? Dear Lord, dear dwelling place, dear sanctuary of silence, you are the home for which we deeply yearn. You are the resting place for which we long, where we find both comfort and challenge. Keep us open to your transforming power. Give us the blessing of your companionship. In Jesus' name, amen. So now we're going to sing, and the song is in your bulletin, because it's not in the hymn book. And this is, a, this is an old time gospel song that I learned when I was a kid. And I don't know how many of you know it, but let's try it together, shall we? And we're only going to do the first three verses. We're not going to do verse four.
have um, a memory that today is Shirley and Morris's wedding anniversary. 68. It's 68, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we want to celebrate that. Shirley and Morris's 68th anniversary. Okay, and of course, Pray for Roy. Yes, let's just ask and pray for the Lord to make sure that we can take yeah. care for Roy. But he had surgery and he was up walking this morning, so he's making progress. Yes. Now, I probably should say for those of you who may not have heard that, um, well, first, um, Roy's brother Ron passed away. Now, I'm not sure if we knew that last Sunday or not. I think we did. But then on Friday, Roy had a fall at home and broke his hip. So, you know, he was brought to the hospital. It took them ages to be able to look at him. And I don't think he had a surgery till Saturday. So, have you been in to see him, Pat? You did get in. Oh, yeah. No, I've been in. Um, I'm going after church. But, uh, right. He, you know, he is who he is. He's in good spirits. Even though one more thing. Yeah. Okay, so that's Roy. And that's probably about a three month yep. recovery time at least. Well, I mean, it was going to be ongoing, but intensively, intensive healing for three months, yeah. And our grass will be as high as the hook. <laughs> Unless I can learn to sit on the ride. <laughs> I'll come and mow your lawn. Anything else? We want um, to? Yes, Brenda would like it if we could have thoughts and prayers for the family and friends of Amy Mills, yes. longtime friend and member of St. Paul's United. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Ashton says she's still missing candy a lot. Okay. And if we could pray for her Aunt Janet Simmons. Yes, all the thunderstorms that took place in Ontario, and I think four people have died, and yeah. several of them because trees fell on them. I mean, those trees obviously are heavy and deadly. I, I'd like for us to say prayers for the family of uh, Devin Marsman. He's the young uh, teenager that's been missing for the last three months. Oh, okay. And they just are sad. They don't know. His name is Devin Marsden. Okay. They don't know where he is. The police don't think there's foul play, but I didn't quite understand that. If he's missing, how could they not think? But well, they, they don't know if he ran away or mm. if he went with somebody. And yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound like there was bad blood in, between him and his mother, but no. But he's no. 16, and he's she doesn't know where he is. And that's a worry. Yeah. They were saying yesterday he may have been abducted. Oh. Uh, into, the, into the trade, the human trafficking trade. Okay, but they don't really. No, know. they're just. They, they they don't. Don't. They're looking at all possibilities. Sure. Anything else? I would like to pray for Zachary. Pray for Zachary. Anybody else? Okay, let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for how you made us and set us in this beautiful world, breathing your very breath of life into us and giving to us this wonderful faith community for comfort and support. Oh God, you sent your child Jesus to be with us as a teacher, companion, and guide. Help us to remember his ways of being open and unafraid. You didn't allow death to be the end of Jesus' life, but you raised him from death to be a sign to all the world of the life-giving hope you offer everyone. 
Help us offer life and hope to everyone we meet. Hear our prayers now as we ask that you hold these people in your love. Emma, Nick, Judy, Okay, Doug, and Travis, Phyllis, Ashton, Chrissy, Bucky, Randall. We pray for Zachary. Lord, we are offering a special prayer for Roy. Um, we pray for healing. We lift Roy and Pat and the whole family who are so worried about him and um, they love him so much and they're, they're hoping for the best. They're hoping for good healing and that's what we pray for too, O oh Lord. And we pray for the family of Mrs. Amy Mills, uh, a longtime member of St. Paul's in Spryfield, but a friend to many. We know that Ash is missing candy, so we pray. We pray for Ashton and her um, feeling of, of, of caring for her friend and also for her Aunt Janet Simmons. We pray for the people of Ontario. And we pray for the family of Devin Marsden, who's missing. We do celebrate the 68th anniversary of Shirley and Morris. They're so happy they're still with us and we hope they have a great anniversary. Loving God, we pray for all those who are hungry or homeless. We pray for the ones who are lonely and lost. We pray for all who are ill or in pain, who are grieving or afraid. Be with the ones who are struggling with COVID-19 and those who continue to care for them. Dear Lord, hear our prayers for all who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for areas of the world embroiled in conflict. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. And as we say, we pray for the families of those in Ontario who died from the dangerous thunderstorms that have devastated that region. We know there are windstorms across Europe, so we pray for the safety of all. And now, loving God, we offer you our silent prayers for those things not spoken aloud, but that are in our hearts. These and all our prayers we bring to you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now our invitation to the offering. Friends, we are amazed by God's love, which is for each one of us and for all of us together. We're invited to offer our gifts as a response to that love and also as a sign of our commitment to live that love in all we do. Please join in our offering hymn, which is at the bottom of page two in your bulletin. Please stand as you're able. Excited to share with those around us. 
Bless our gifts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And our final hymn is number 626, I Heard the Voice of Jesus.